Today we're going to talk about, uh, we're, well, we're going to cover a little bit of our nest box check and sort of a research update. And then we're also going to talk about uh, nesting development. And um, so we have a PowerPoint and then we have uh, a little bit of video footage. And then I've also got a couple of, because uh, I know uh, several of the audience members are Bluebird experts. So I've actually got a couple of questions for you all um, at, at the end. So today we're talking about nestling development. But before we do that, I want to give you guys a brief research update. So as of yesterday, uh, we have nests at 10 of our sites. So uh, about half of our sites are occupied now. Um, two of our nests have hatched. Um, one nest, uh, the nestlings are 12 days old today. So, to, uh, so today was the last day we poked uh, a camera in to look at them. Uh, and then the other nestlings are four days old. And we have five nests where they're incubating, a uh, total of 24 eggs across those five nests. Uh, two nests are still being laid. Uh, uh, on Friday, they each had two eggs. And one nest is complete, uh, but doesn't yet have any eggs. So if you went online to our virtual classroom, there's a video on there that shows a 360 view of all of our nest sites. So if you ever wanted to check and see which nest uh, sites are occupied, uh, our numbers are 2, 4, 6, 9, and 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, and 19. So those are the sites where we have occupied nest. Now it's pretty interesting so far. No, None of our bluebirds have chosen the Gilbertson boxes. They've all chosen either the NAVS or the Florida Bluebird box design. And equally too, there's five nests in each design. Now one thing we have noticed, and this has occurred at uh, three different sites where it looks like the Bluebird started in one box um, and put a couple little sprigs and twigs in one box and then moved right down 30 meters away to the other box and ended up building a nest there. So we've got a few uh, attempted nests where they changed their mind. But even those, there's no Gilbertsons. Those were all just started in an abs and switched to a Florida Bluebird Society or vice versa. So let's talk about Bluebird daily growth. And so these images are from Cialis.org. So on day one, that's when the nestlings are born. It might take them one to six hours to pip to, from starting to pip through that shell to get all the way through. Um, and even though uh, nestlings normally all hatch on the same day, it could take up to 24 or even 48 hours for all the eggs to hatch. And typically hatching starts in the early morning. Now in these early days, um, the, uh, the bluebird nestlings, they're, they're born with their eyes sealed shut, very little feathers, you got that bright pink coral skin, a little bit of fuzz and that's about it. Um, the parents are going to be feeding them every 30 minutes. And we've seen this with our with our camera as well, uh, when the light sort of changes in the box. Uh, so we're sitting uh, when we send our little bariscope camera in, um, or when they're able to hear us nearby, those young nestlings are going to gape wide open, right? They're going to open their mouth up really wide. And what that is is a signal to the parents, feed me. So by day four, nestlings are gonna weigh 10 grams. And 10 grams is the same weight as two nickels. So pretty small. By day six, their eyes might start to open just in slits and they're starting to get more feathers and more development and a little bit bigger. Now by day seven, so prior to day seven, days one through six, the mother is still coming in and brooding on her nestlings to keep them warm because they can't maintain their own body temperature. But by day seven, they've gained enough feathers and enough control over their systems where they can maintain their own body temperature. And so the female is no longer brooding on the nest. By day nine, the eyes can fully open and you see that these animals are developing uh, more rapidly. Now in this example that was on Cialis.org, you can see that there's one uh, runt of the of the nest that isn't developing as quickly, right? This was that, uh, in this example, was an egg that uh, didn't hatch on the first day. So this animal is just a little bit further behind. So it has a little bit uh, lower nest uh, feather development in the nest. Now, typically by day nine, 
these these nestlings are going to start uh, reacting more in fear or, or aversion to things that aren't its parents. And so you don't see the gaping as frequently when you're approaching or monitoring the box. By day 11, nestlings uh, are nearly completely feathered. There are just a few spots that aren't feathered. And day 12 is sort of a critical date. So after day 12, then these nestlings could fledge if they're disturbed too much. So uh, here with our project, day 12 is the last day that we stick our Bariscope camera in to take a peek at them. And we're going to be monitoring when they fledge using our trail cameras. So we don't want to cause any premature fledging because by day 12, uh, they can move around and potentially even climb out and fall out of the nest box. By day 14, they might even be capable of short flight and they may peek their heads out that nest and, and take a peek. And you can also see uh, that they're starting to get a little more color in their feathers. You got some blue on some of those uh, nestlings. Um, by day 17, that's usually when fledglings might start actually to leave the box naturally. Now it might take them a few days. It might be day 18, 19, or even 20 before they leave the nest box, but they can leave as early as day 17. And in this example from Cialis.org, there's that runt that was born a day or two late. Well, it didn't leave the nest box till day, uh, somewhere between day 20, day 21. So um, now I, I want to, I guess, cover a few things that we're gonna cover in our video. Um, we're gonna take a look at our different nest boxes uh, and what we've got in them. We've got some different videos of some of our Bariscope cameras, and occasionally we're able to uh, send the iPhone's camera lens in to take a peek as well. Um, but one thing we've noticed is there's a great deal of variability in nest height within the box. So there's short uh, height boxes, and we'll see those in the video, medium height and tall heights, uh, how much material they've built up inside that box. And so I think that's interesting, and we're doing, recording that information because that could uh, impact temperature within the box, which is one of the things that we're measuring. So, um, and then the other interesting thing, so we've got one nest, the, the nest was completed on March 1st, and so we estimated hatch date around March 15th, right? Because after the nest has been completed, 12 to 14 to, days uh, to hatch. Uh, but these eggs still haven't hatched, but the female and the male are still guarding and protecting the nest. The female's still brooding, and in fact, they they swoop us whenever we approach, um, but they haven't yet hatched yet, and so it's been quite a while. We expected the hatch two weeks ago, so we we're thinking that the eggs might be sterile, and so in, in other, like when you're doing stuff with wood ducks, for example, uh, monitoring wood duck's nest, you would candle that egg to make sure that it's uh, still fertile after this long delay. And so we're thinking, is it possible to candle a bluebird egg um, to know if it is still fertile or not? So that's one of the things that we've been thinking about doing is checking up on that nest. Now we have, you know, occasionally after the female finishes laying the eggs, she might delay incubation for uh, a week or even 10 days. And so if she did that, maybe we're just a few days late, but still we're uh, we're stretching the time here for sure. Um, so we, we'd like them to to re-nest if, if those are sterile eggs. So we're going to be thinking about that and, and happy to hear any of your guys' thoughts on what to do in that situation. So Mike was, Mike uh, is saying another possibility is predation and a new nest full of eggs. Right, so he's saying in his, in, he's had some cases where he's not watching so closely and uh, the eggs got predated and then a new uh, batch of eggs were laid. And that's uh, possible. Um, I mean, we do have our predator guards and we've uh, applied uh, axle grease uh, to further protect the the nest boxes uh, on their poles from things climbing up. And we have trail cams on these nests. So we would think that if anything could get in there and consume those eggs that we would have caught it on camera or, or seen a bit more. Because once 
Uh, once we have eggs laid, we're checking our boxes every other day. We, we send the baroscope camera in every other day to, to check up on those. Alrighty, uh, so let's, uh, well, this is uh, just a brief slide on our, our next session is going to be on May 1st, where we're going to have some more nest box checking uh, videos and talk a bit more about the role of birds in rangeland systems. Um, so let's go ahead and switch to the video here. So we're here at 6B, and 6B is a, a NABS box. I wanted to show you 6B because it's a fairly short nest relative to the others. Now, our shortest nest is actually 2A, which has those chicks that are nine days old in it. So we didn't want to open that one up, but this one is also a fairly short nest. So this is nest box 13C. It's one of the Florida Bluebird Society designs. And when we open it up, it's got a nest in here. So I'm just going to open it up just a little bit. You can see that the height of the nest structure there um, it's probably about medium, right? So we're going to see some other nest heights uh, inside these boxes that are short and some really tall ones as well. This one doesn't have any eggs in it yet. All right, so we're here at nest box 9B. It's a Florida Bluebird Society design. And I wanted, this one's actually got five eggs in it. The female just flushed out as we approached, but I wanted to just quickly open it up to show you uh, the variation in nest uh, height within the box. So this is one of our taller ones. You can see it's much higher than those medium and low height uh, nest structures inside the box. So this is a uh, nest box 14A. It's a Florida Bluebird Society design. When we zoom in here, we can see that this box, it's got a little bit of damage around that entrance hole. Right, so that's uh, woodpeckers trying to enlarge that hole. And so we've set up a, a camera and we're gonna be able to tell, hopefully, who's been doing this damage. Now, I'm gonna open this box up. So this one, like I said, is uh, 14A. Now 60, meteor, 60, meteors, 60 meters down the road is 14C, which is an occupied nest box and has five eggs in it. Well, 14A, it looks like they probably initially came here, did a little bit of nest construction, and then switched over. So interesting uh, behavior there. And we've seen that multiple times. So part of uh, our research is we're recording the temperature within the nest boxes. And so to do that, we're using these little I button temperature loggers. So this is one of those. And this logger is going to record the temperature inside the nest box every 15 minutes for about 21 days. So we're going to deploy these I buttons uh, right before the eggs are supposed to hatch, usually a day or two before our expected hatch date. And we're doing that for a few reasons. The first reason is um, we want to capture the temperature within that nest box for the entire time that nestlings are hatched, all the way till they fledge. However, we don't want to cause any sort of disturbance that would result in the bluebirds abandoning the nest. So to incentivize or to uh, reduce the risk of that, we're putting that uh, temperature logger button out right before the eggs are supposed to hatch. And the way we're doing that, so we're, uh, we've seen them in a few of our videos of, of inside the nest boxes, is um, the first step is super gluing a piece of Velcro on the back of the logger. So there's the back side. And it's important to do that super glue of the Velcro strip on the back side because this side is the side that interacts with the, um, the, the logger software so that we can download that temperature data. So we put a little bit of super glue on the back side there and then our strip of Velcro and hold it for a little bit. Now you want to be careful because the Velcro is a bit porous, uh, so that super glue might leak through the Velcro and stick your finger to the Velcro and to uh, the eye button. So be a bit careful with that. Uh, now we cut just a, a strip that's just going to perfectly fit on that eye uh, eye button, and then we cut a different strip of Velcro uh, that we a bit longer and so that's a uh, strip we're going to attach to the inside of the nest box wall using a thumbtack right so that's the easiest way 
just push it into the back, push it through the Velcro strip and into the back of the wall of the nest box right above the nest. Um, and then you can attach the I button with its Velcro um, directly to the Velcro strip on the nest box. And you can easily remove it uh, that way. As well. So this is nest box 2A, it's a NAB's design. Now this nest box, uh, the eggs um, were, the laying was completed on March 1st and they hatched on March 15th. So this is day nine. So now these guys are gonna have open eyes, gonna be pretty developed. Remember day 12 is when uh, uh, you kinda wanna back away and let it take its course because you don't want to disturb the fledgling. So we're, we're still a few days away from that, but see, Got four uh, nestlings in here. Open eyes there, just calmly waiting for their parents to return and feed them. We're at nest box 15B. This is a NABS box. And this was our scheduled hatch day. So zoom in here and see if we can see right inside. Don't want to disturb too much. There we have two hatchlings just hatched and three eggs. It's quite exciting. You see uh, that new hatchling gaping, right? So trying to uh, signal to its parents that it's hungry. So cool, we're gonna keep a close eye on this. And you can sort of see in the background there uh, is one of our temperature loggers, right? We put that in a few days ago. So sometimes when we're out and about uh, checking our bluebird nest boxes, we see interesting uh, other wildlife occurrences. So what we've got going on here 
is part of a dung beetle. And you can see that the dung beetle is actually speared onto that barbed wire. And so uh, what's happened is a loggerhead shrike has caught this beetle and speared it onto the barb so that it can easily consume it. So whenever you see insects sort of speared on barbed wire like that, it's probably a shrike that's done it. It's a pretty neat uh, sort of interaction between human uh, disturbances like barbed wire fence and native wildlife like the loggerhead shrike. All right. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty exciting uh, last few weeks here with uh, with a lot of our uh, eggs starting to hatch, and we've got three nests that are gonna. One nest actually, we just deployed the temperature logger in it today because it's supposed to hatch on Monday, so we wanted that temperature logger to be in there. And then we've got uh, two more uh, nests that are supposed to hatch around April fourth. So getting uh, getting exciting. Um, now, I, I want to say uh, Mike chimed in and said uh, with those few strands of grass uh, that we're seeing in some of the nest boxes, uh, he's saying uh, that they typically call those claim straws, uh, uh, like the bluebirds are uh, putting dibs on that box. Um, but he thinks uh, what's actually going on is they're inspecting the box. They, they start to do that nest, but then they're not finding enough material uh, to continue building that nest, not enough egg or not enough grass or enough uh, vegetation to build the nest. And so then they abandon because they can't find it and they move on. Now we've seen, so we've seen those, uh, those sort of early abandoned nest or claim straws. We've seen them in three uh, sites where then the bluebirds 30 meters away or 60 meters, meters away built a full nest and laid eggs. Um, and at one site, the bluebirds built uh, claim straws in one box and then uh, seemingly uh, pulled those straws back out because they were there for a week and then they were gone. Uh, and there's been no bluebirds at that site since then. Um, then we have another interesting uh, uh, development that we just uh, found on Friday. So uh, on Friday, we have two nests. We have one of our nest box sites, it's site 12. And it's got a NABS and a Florida Bluebird Society 30 meters apart right, uh, right down the pasture lane from them. And the birds built a complete nest in, in the Florida Bluebird Society box. Um, and then after they built that complete nest, they put a few of those dib straws uh, in the NABS box, but then they didn't finish the NABS nest. So, uh, now on Friday, we had one egg in the completed nest in the Florida Bluebird Society box and one egg in uh, the NABS box that just had a couple of those straws in it. So we thought, well, oh, they, <laughs> they've made a mistake. They've dropped an egg in, in, in a box that doesn't have a nest completed in it. So I thought that was an interesting occurrence. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep an eye on it and see if they keep laying in the box that has uh, a knot that has a nest in it or in the box that doesn't have the nest. All right, so I'm seeing a, a comment here from Joanne. So she's got a nest cam on her birds, which hopefully we'll be able to share uh, links to those nest cams uh, that the Florida Bluebird Society uh, has on our Bluebird Virtual Classroom so everyone can check them out. Um, and so she's got a nest cam uh, and she was observing a female starting to bring in material in February into the nest box and then the male took all of it out and then the female started again in March and he only took a couple out 
um, but she was able to uh, complete the nest. So that's interesting. So <laughs> perhaps uh, that is what occurred in our, that was at site one. Uh, perhaps that's what occurred at site one where we had a start of a nest and then no material at all after that and then nothing since then. Um, so yeah, we're certainly getting some interesting occurrences with our eggs that haven't, that have seemingly haven't hatched uh, in 20, six days um, and uh, our box, our eggs in an uncompleted nest right next to a completed nest that also has one egg. And then our our mystery straws uh, disappearing. So a couple of interesting things to keep monitoring. Um, now I will note that originally our research had planned on uh, weighing the eggs uh, weighing the nestlings, uh, so weighing the eggs right before they hatch, weighing the nestlings uh, on day six, and then again on day 12 to look at growth rates and things like that. So we put in, you know, obviously you, you can't do this without permits, uh, and we put in for both state and federal permits, and I think, I suspect, because of the government transition, uh, there's been some sort of delays in those permits. So we have not uh, gotten all the permits to do uh, the weighing of the eggs and the nestlings. So we're not doing that. Um, we're hopefully will be <laughs> hopefully permits will come in for next year, uh, so that we can uh, monitor growth rate uh, like that. But we are continuing to monitor temperature and obviously uh, nestling survival and, and number of eggs laid and then fledgling as well. So I'm happy to report that all of our eggs that uh, that on the two boxes that eggs have hatched in so far, all of those eggs have hatched. And as of right now, all those nestlings are still alive. So that's great. Um, we just got to figure out what's going on with that one nest box. So um, if there's uh, any questions or comments, I'm happy to uh, to answer or, or chat more about some of the, the things we're observing. I do think it's really interesting that uh, there's no Gilbertson boxes that have been occupied so far. Because Gilbertson boxes are used a lot by other bluebird researchers. And I'm wondering, uh, well, one of the reasons Gilbertsons are used a lot by bluebird researchers is because they're easy um, uh, to build and deploy. Um, and um, so one of the reasons they're, they're used is because they're easy to build and deploy. but we're not seeing the bluebirds choosing those boxes. And so it could be that when you only deploy Gilbertsons, the bluebirds choose them, but they might not be their preference. Or it could be that we have a fairly natural system uh, compared to uh, some other sites that people are doing bluebird research in more suburban areas or on university campuses, for example. And so birds that live there might be a bit more acquainted or used to sort of non-wood materials in the landscape and more inclined to nest in a box that's made of plastic and wood instead of just a box made of wood. But we're gonna keep monitoring that, see if anything changes over time. Uh, and if they decide to, any of our birds decide to re-nest in a different nest box at the same site. Um, so we have a couple of questions about the temperature loggers. And uh, next session, we'll have an actual video talk a bit more about the temp loggers. We actually deployed, we've deployed three of them now, um, but we don't have a video of actually deploying it, but we'll make sure we have a video and perhaps include it in the next little short video update. But the temperature loggers, uh, they're iButton links. Uh, so we got them from iButton.com, I think. Um, now we've programmed them, uh, these little iButton temperature loggers record a set amount of temperatures and dates and timestamps. I think it's something like 6,048 or something. That's how much memory they have. So you then program how frequent you want the temperature to be recorded. And um, then depending on how much memory is available in the, in the temperature logger, that determines for how long you can monitor temperature at that frequency. So we decided every 15 minutes for 21 days and we deploy the loggers right before the eggs are supposed to hatch so that we get the temperature during the entire nestling to fledgling phase. So we haven't, um, so Joanne was asking what the temperatures have looked like so far. 
and we haven't pulled any of the loggers out. So the system we've got, uh, you can't download the temperatures until you have the logger in hand. And we don't want to disturb the nest till the fledglings leave. Uh, uh, so we don't want to pull that logger back out. But as soon as we get some, some temperature, and it should be soon uh, by probably the end of next week, uh, at least on that first box, because those birds are 12 days old today. So they should be fledged by uh, next weekend. So we'll be able to take a look at that temperature and see what it looks like. Um, and Joanne also suggested setting a, uh, a temperature logger in a Gilbertson box, even if we're not getting any, any eggs in it. And she uh, thinks that would be interesting. And I agree. Uh, I've actually been thinking about uh, doing that at one of our one or two of our sites uh, that don't have any nest in them at all. Just set a temperature logger in all three boxes at that site uh, and get some baseline temperature. Now, I'm also thinking that the, the height of the nest within the box is going to influence temperature as well. So and we are measuring that. Um, as soon as the fledglings fledge, we're going to get a, a good measurement on nest height for any of the nest boxes. So we've, uh, uh, Con, Convy, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, suggest moving the egg uh, that's in the box without any nesting material into the other nest. We have thought about that. Um, and we're gonna put, yeah, we do have a camera up at that box. So we're, we're reviewing the camera images now to see if she's going in that box to do any sort of care for that egg. But we have thought about moving uh, that egg into the other box. Um, but we're, we want to see what she does. We're going to check it as soon as we're done here to see what's going on. But Yeah, and Mike uh, says uh, that the Gilbertson boxes, where, the, the, where they are the only choice, they might get more use. And I, I agree with that. I mean, they're a lot of researchers use Gilbertsons and they get a lot of birds in their boxes. So clearly Gilbertsons will be used. Um, but when there is a choice, perhaps they do choose these wooden boxes. So I think that's sort of an interesting uh, uh, finding even so far. I mean, I know we've only got 10 sites occupied, but clearly they're, they're showing a preference even with just 10, uh, 10 sites. So that's interesting. Um, I would note that uh, the study done at Gainesville, uh, at the University of Florida, Gainesville's main campus that looked at Gilbertson's and Peterson boxes, which are wood, uh, found equal use um, among those two uh, uh, nest box designs on the Gain Gainesville main campus. Um, so in that situation, bluebirds weren't showing a preference for the more natural box or, or showing a uh, dislike or uh, not dislike, but just not preferring the Gilbertson boxes like they are here. So certainly something to continue to think about. Uh, Joanne asked about two boxes used at the same site, uh, other than our single egg in the box with no nest. And that hasn't occurred yet. Um, other researchers that have done, uh, for example, that main campus, uh, University of Florida main campus study, did find that the, they were having bluebirds nest in both the Peterson and Gilbertsons that were 30 meters apart. We have not seen that happen yet here. Um, but, you know, we just, it was just Friday where we discovered a brand new nest on Friday. So I think we're still having bluebirds move into boxes here. So I don't think, uh, I don't necessarily think that we're done with sites being occupied here. So uh, we'll certainly keep monitoring that. So it would be interesting to see. So has anyone ever tried to candle uh, a bluebird egg? So that's when um, uh, you hold the egg up to a light source, not in a candle. You don't want to actually have heat or anything, but just a light source so that you can see through the membrane of the egg to see if it's developing, to see if it looks fertile. Um, so, you know, I've, uh, some of the, my colleagues have done it with duck eggs, but duck eggs are a lot bigger and a lot firmer. So I'm a little hesitant about doing it with a little tiny bluebird egg.
Okay, we got a lot of, um, yes, so Joanne says, ask, if, all right, so a lot, of, a lot of comments came in here real quick, so I'll go through them as I can. Um, so sticking on the candling just briefly, Joanne suggested we might need a permit. That's a good point. Um, there is, I mean, obviously you can, at the, at the end of a nesting season, you could clear out unhatched eggs. Uh, you, you can remove things like that. So uh, that's something I want to look into. I don't want to do anything that is not allowed, and I certainly don't want to hurt any eggs. Um, these birds are clearly still uh, incubating and protecting and monitoring their nest. So I think that's important, and that's a lot of my hesitation about doing any, any sort of manipulation. Now. Uh, Let's see what uh, it would. Uh, let's see. Mike had also uh, said it would be interesting to look at temperatures of empty boxes, uh, uh, and so putting temperature lockers in the Gilbertsons, the Florida Bluebird Society, and the NABs all at one side. And that's something I think we're going to be doing uh, next week because I, I, I do want to get that baseline temperature difference, and I think that's a great idea. And then we see we've got uh, Brenda uh, sort of changing the subject, but that's all right. Saying, has anyone ever discovered foreign material in in their nest uh, box? Uh, she discovered scotch tape in her box today. Um, we haven't seen anything foreign material, but we're in a really natural site for the most part. Um, the most we've seen is feathers. Uh, and Mike chimes in, and he's absolutely right. House sparrows often use foreign material, and that's absolutely true. Uh, they have a much ness uh, messier nest in general, too. And we haven't, uh, I don't think we have house sparrows here. We haven't seen any, but we've been on the lookout, but haven't seen any here. And we also think, uh, we showed that video of that, uh, the woodpecker trying to enlarge one of the holes. We put, as soon as we discovered that, we put a camera up. Uh, we have not been able to capture that woodpecker doing that again. So I think uh, the woodpecker gave up or moved on. Well, and Joanne suggested, if possible, candling that single egg that was laid in the uh, in the nest box that doesn't have a nest in it might be interesting. And I agree, but I, I, I do think, yeah, it's important to make sure we're doing uh, doing everything by the book in terms of protecting the bluebirds, right? Safety of the birds is the number one priority. Um, Joanne suggested if you have are experiencing a lot of woodpecker damage to put up metal guards, and that's right, they, they can't enlarge or damage the hole uh, if there's metal guards up. and uh, we talked a little bit about the metal guards in one of our previous videos. We don't have those here yet, uh, but it's something to consider, S certainly if we continue to have some woodpecker damage like that. Um, so, so far, no, uh, Joanne was asking about predation and fire ants, and so far we've got none of those issues. I mean, we do have, so uh, we showed this in one of the videos we posted to the virtual classroom, but we've decided on fire, uh, instead of doing direct fire ant control via boiling water or chemicals, we have decided to, to leave the fire ants alone, but then further protect uh, the nest boxes uh, from fire ants. So what we're doing is applying uh, axle grease um, on the poles uh, to protect anything from climbing up. Uh, and that includes ants. It's really sticky. Ants are not going to be able to climb up it. Um, and we we were given that tip by a couple of bluebird researchers, and, and that's what they use. Now, in, in this heat, uh, we do sort of check the stickiness of those uh, of the axle grease, and we have already reapplied. We're finding we're reapplying it about every two weeks. Um, we haven't seen any other signs of predation, so. What happens, our strategy uh, is as soon as a nest, uh, we detect a nest being constructed, even with a couple of those dib straws or a completed nest, we put a camera up uh, that's in monitoring that nest. Uh, 
can see and the camera has a complete view from the ground all the way to above the above the nest box so if there's any sort of large uh, predators like raccoons or snakes or birds uh, attempting predation uh, we should capture that on the camera and we haven't detected any of that yet now the ants uh, we wouldn't be able to detect them on the camera or anything uh, small on the camera but uh, as soon as eggs are laid we put that axle grease uh, on uh, the bird uh, on the nest boxes pole and we've been looking to see if there's anything stuck in the axle grease and so far it's mostly vegetation and flies uh, we haven't seen any uh, ants uh, caught in the grease Uh, Mike had su also suggested, uh, if used carefully, uh, uh, di <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to pronounce it, diatomous earth, uh, if used carefully, can combat ant problems. And then uh, Convy has also said that he's had a lot of trouble, or they have had a lot of trouble uh, with uh, Wood, uh, woodpeckers and applying both predator guards and metal plates uh, and he finally uh, and they finally got the woodpecker to leave the box alone yeah so Brenda is asking about wasp and it's been sort of interesting uh, We've got a lot of wasp uh, that come into our empty boxes. Uh, we've got a couple of different species of paper wasp and a mud dauber wasp that we've detected and a lot of spiders, uh, jumping spiders, orb weavers. Uh, we always clean those out uh, as soon as we detect them. Um, but interestingly, we haven't detected wasp uh, in boxes or around boxes that have nests in them. So I don't know if the bluebirds are doing doing their own protection or what but we have we've looked for it and we haven't seen it um and we've yeah we just haven't seen it so we're going to keep monitoring uh for it because certainly wasp and bluebirds don't get along and, and we wouldn't want wasps to drive bluebirds away from a box brenda uh, suggests looking under and inside the nesting box and, and we do look inside the nesting box um on our weekly checks, we open up the side and peek in and peek under uh, when we open up the side. Uh, and then once there's eggs in there, we're, we use the uh, uh, boroscope camera to look inside the box and, and we're able to move that around and see sort of everywhere in the box. And then we also always uh, check the predator guard. You know, we're looking to see if wasps are buzzing around. So. One thing that I've been sort of using, uh, I really enjoy, is the iNaturalist app. And so I download that app, I put it on my phone, and then whenever I see uh, anything that I don't know what it is, uh, especially around these bluebird checks like uh, flowers, uh, wasp, spiders, I try to snap a photo and then the iNaturalist app will use this uh, photo recognition uh, software to sort of give you an estimate of what that species is. And you can take a look at what they estimate uh, guess what they estimate that species is, and then you can look at images of that species compared to what you see, and you can say, I agree with that ID. And then that goes out to the iNaturalist community, and often you'll get someone responding saying, yes, I agree with your identification, or no, uh, it's something different. And so that's the way I've been learning a lot of my Florida species, and I really like the app. Yep. Um, let's see, using, all right, so Mike suggests using soap along the ceiling of the nest box, rubbing it in, leaves a slick surface that the European paper wasps can't attach their nest to. And also good ventilation along the top of the box discourages wasps. So we do have uh, our three ventilation holes along the top of either side of the box. Uh, now, we haven't applied soap, uh, but I've seen that done before, or heard that done before, so. Bar soap, Mike says. So yeah, along with the iNaturalist app, I also have the eBird app on my phone and um, a couple other 
uh, apps, and those I use those a lot in the field. I always like to eBird what I see uh, here at the station when I see it. So James uh, 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 has said that fire ants are invasive and dangerous to wildlife and domestic animals like cattle and horses. I absolutely agree. Uh, he says they need to be eliminated on site. I also uh, agree with that. Um, and there is a lot of treatment that does happen here at the station, especially uh, in around other research sites. Uh, where they're doing different work, but they're just, they are everywhere here. And one of the reasons I hesitate to use chemical treatment is that it can be bad for native ants, which are, are also here. So uh, I keep hoping uh, for better treatment op options in the future, um, but it's certainly, they are bad for uh, uh, native wildlife and they can be hard on, on domestic animals as well. It, it's a tricky situation, fire ant control and management, and it's there's not easy answers. And I'll note that on our virtual classroom website, which uh, I've sent out the link to, we've got a couple of uh, UF documents that lay out specific strategies uh, to not only remove fire ants from your property, but also discourage them as well. Um, and they, they explain how to use the chemicals safely and how to even use the chemicals in a way that uh, minimizes the, uh, the damage to native ant species. And if, if you're interested in that, I would certainly suggest looking into that more. I think there's a lot of good extension work by entomologist faculty at UF uh, that are working on fire ant control. All right, um, it's getting sort of uh, close to the ending time. So um, thank you all for tuning in. I always like this back and forth. It's been really helpful and really informative. And I hope you guys have been enjoying uh, these little peeks into the, our research project uh, and learning a bit about bluebirds along the way. So our next session will be on May 1st. Um, and we'll show some more of our checks, hopefully have even more of a research update. We'll certainly have birds fledged by May 1st, so hopefully have some nice uh, wildlife trail cam photos and videos of, of those events happening. And we'll talk a little bit more about the role bluebirds play uh, in the ecosystem, what sort of things they consume uh, and, and how their uh, how other birds also play roles in rangeland systems like here at the station. Alrighty, uh, thank you for attending. Um, and all obviously this will be posted online at the virtual classroom site um, in a few days. All right, thanks everyone.